Hey everyone, if my voice sounds a little rough today, it's because I'm still recovering from COVID. Uh, so have patience with me, please. Uh, but we're here today to talk about ERVs, endogenous retroviruses. Are they airtight evidence for evolution? Yes, they are, contrary to claims of young earth creationists. Recently, I had a chance to converse with Barry Desborough, an expert on this question who has loads of experience debating young earth creationists about this. Barry runs a blog, Barry his blog, and I'll link to it below in the description. Barry and I have different views on the existence of God, but we share a passion for correcting the falsehoods of young earth creationism. Now, Barry and I had trouble linking up our schedules, so I asked him questions via text, and he answered my questions via video. My first question for Barry was how he got interested in this topic. I'm a British. I went to train as a teacher at a Christian-founded college of education. Although I'm not a believer myself, I have no quarrel with theists who accept mainstream science. And I understand the point of view that accepts that all that happens in nature is by the will of God. They accepted me at the college because they recognised in me someone who would be likely to be of value in education. I already had an interest in evolution and the college taught courses on 19th century thought, including that of Darwin. By the way, they took us on a trip to Darwin's Down House. I've always been puzzled and perplexed about human nature. How can we be so destructive and wasteful and stupid and cruel to each other? We are supposed to be homo sapiens sapiens. Why is it man? I managed to retire early. What to do with my time? I studied human nature. I came to evolutionary psychology, how our brains and minds are the products of evolution. Did this and our close relationship with the other primates and their behaviour shed any light on why we are the way we are? It was only when discussing these things with American academics that I found out, to my astonishment, that a significant number of particularly Americans believed that evolution was false, the world was created last Thursday, or, or sorry, 6,000 years ago or something, I thought that these ideas had petered out in the 19th century. How can we learn from our evolution and our primate relatives if we do not recognise that we are evolved and that we are their close relatives? Long story short, I got involved with debating creationists. Eventually, I came across endogenous retroviruses, ERVs, and the fact that they are slam-dunk evidence for common ancestry, beyond any reasonable doubt. Creationists only have unreasonable doubts, as I shall be explaining. Next, I asked Barry to briefly describe what an ERV is. ERV is an acronym for endogenous retrovirus. OK, let's do this backwards. ERV backwards is VRE. V is for virus. This is a particle that infects host organism cells. It contains genomes, instructions in the form of either RNA or DNA. These are more like commands to make the cell produce more viruses. R is for retro. This refers to the way in which certain viruses, the retroviruses, operate. First, their genomes are in RNA form. On infecting a host cell, they get the cell machinery to produce DNA copies of their genomes. This goes opposite, retro, to the way cell machinery usually operates, which is to read DNA to make RNA. The best known retrovirus is HRV, which prompted a huge amount of research into the subject of retrovirology. E is for endogenous. When a retrovirus invades a germline cell and integrates with the native nuclear DNA, the viral DNA becomes heritable along with the rest of the cell's DNA. The viral DNA can be passed down to offspring and onto theirs and so on without further viral infection from without. Endo means within. Now, young earth creationists argue that ERVs could have been placed in the human genome at the time of a direct creation, and so may not actually be ERVs. 
I asked Barry how we know the young earth creationists are wrong. There are many reasons why this cannot make any sense. The devil is, as they say, in the details. What did the creator create Eavis for? The nearest that creationists and intelligent designer spotters come to try to explain it is to say that they were for gen generating genetic variation. This is an appeal, ironically, to evolutionary concepts. Responses to this appear in the notes below from my pages and videos from John Perry. There are indeed many reasons why this YEC claim does not make sense. Barry and I both recommend John Perry's video on this topic, which I'll link to in the description. John gives 11 lines of compelling evidence that ERVs entered an existing genome. My favorite is that there are fingerprints of the insertion event left at the ends of each ERV. The insertions are caught on tape, if you will. Now, what convinced me that ERVs are rock solid evidence for evolution is the locations we find them, for example, in chimps and humans. We find them again and again and again in the exact same locations in our respective genomes. The only way this happens is if we inherited the ERVs from a common ancestor. I asked Barry if he agreed that this line of evidence is airtight. This is the key fact. We know that integrase, the enzyme that cuts host DNA and inserts the retroviral DNA and then joins it up again, copy and paste, we know it cannot target any specific host DNA locus. Yet to explain away common loci requires target specificity down to a single DNA base pair res resolution. Surveys of integration sites and knowledge of the mechanics of integrase show that this particular kite cannot fly. One thing that young earth creationists point out is that some, repeat some, ERVs have a function, and they say that that somehow means that ERVs are not evidence for common descent. I asked Barry to respond to that. That ERVs are not junk is the most common defense by creationists, and it's a completely dishonest one. They set up a straw man version of the case for common ancestry, asserting that it is dependent on endogenous retroviral DNA being completely without function. It's a rehash of Paley's watchmaker argument that has been discredited for more than 150 years. The superficial appearance of design does not necessarily mean design. Nobody argues that no ERV DNA has any function. That wouldn't make any sense. The ERV DNA is damaged beyond replication competence. Otherwise, to have such proviruses present in every nucleus cell would be fatal. Only some components of some ERVs have function. The rest is mutated or epigenetically silenced or missing. But retroviruses necessarily include their own promoters. Drop a promoter in an unspecified place in the host DNA and there is a good chance it will promote the transcription of downstream DNA whether it originated from the retrovirus itself or it was already present in the host DNA. If such an action confers a benefit, good old natural selection will favour it. The viral DNA has thrown its lot in with the host DNA and its only route to replication is the successful replication of the host. And whole endogenous retroviral genes, like Syncytia, appear in exactly the same relative location in ERVs as environment or env genes appear in retroviruses. Coincidence? It's part of the evolutionary strategy of retroviruses to merge host cells into multinucleated cells. How much more likely is it that a mutation to an already fully functioning gene could provide a different adaptive function compared with the idea that the same gene of this same gene appearing by completely random DNA assembly. By the way, errors in reverse transcription are common. Endogenization occurs on a massive scale and there is no error detection or correction. That's plenty of scope for a huge variation, which is all grist to the mill for evolution. 
Another aha that we've been hearing from creationists is that the RVs protect from further infection by other retroviruses. By, they do this by what is known as super infection exclusion. Both I and John Perry and in, you know, incidentally the entire scientific community explain this. Links can be found in the description. It's another function of non-endogenous retroviruses, those that invade somatic cells, as well as endogenous retroviruses themselves. It is perfectly understandable that viruses, super evolvers that they are, would evolve defences against competitors for their essential resource, which is the host cell that they've infected. Besides, what sense does it make to suppose that a designer would design both infectious agents and defences against infectious agents? A protective function that retroviruses have evolved for their own purposes, just like Syntatia, being found in their endogenized, endogenized remnants, is hardly surprising. Now, as I read more on this topic, I see that it seems like YUC's last-ditch effort here is to conjure up something called V's, or variation-inducing genetic elements. I asked Barry what they are supposed to be, and could they point against common ancestry? The creationist idea of a VIGE, or a VIGE, is that got, uh, no, the designer put ERBs into our genomes so that they would exogenize, release free U retroviruses. They would release them and then reinfect other cells and spread their genetic information. This idea really does reek of desperation. First, why would an omnipotent intelligent designer or whatever find a need to use evolutionary mechanisms, variation, generation followed by selection, to pass its original designs? Why not use more juju magic to poof the DNA directly to fix things as desired? And why use such a hit and miss mechanism as integrase? which, as we've seen, is an indiscriminate scattergun tool, more likely to cause havoc than to confer any benefit. And what about the supposed reintegrations? The idea is that a vige releases a retrovirus, then it re-endogenizes elsewhere. Why do all these reintegrations end up in precisely corresponding loci when we know that integrase cannot produce that result? They have not thought this through. But then, 